My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hi, I'm Valerie Gagliano. Today's executive assistant quote comes from the leader assistant book by Jeremy Burroughs. Leader assistants possess the confidence to make considerate and informed decisions that lead to fruitful actions in the absence of executive presence. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. The Leader Assistant Podcast is exclusively brought to you by Goody, which provides effortless gifting for all occasions. If you're tired of sending tacky, impersonal business gifts, then you should definitely check out Goody. My friends at Goody offer a collection of hundreds of curated brands like Levain Bakery, Therabody, Milk Bar, and Ember Mugs. With Goody, if your recipient doesn't like your gift, they can swap it out for one they do like. You can find perfect gifts for any occasion, whether it's work anniversaries, birthdays, new hire onboarding, or company swag. It's free to start gifting, and you get a $20 credit when you sign up. Also, be sure to mention the Leader Assistant Podcast when signing up, and Goody will add an extra $10 credit to your account. So go to leaderassistant.com slash Goody to disrupt the inefficiencies in your team's gifting strategy. Again, that's leaderassistant.com slash Goody. Hey, friends. This is Jeremy Burroughs, host of the Leader Assistant Podcast. You're listening to episode 169. And today I'm speaking with Valerie Gagliano. Valerie is executive assistant to Gary Vaynerchuk, CEO of Vayner Media. Valerie, how's it going? I'm well, thank you. How are you, Jeremy? I'm happy to be on the show. Yeah, glad to have you. I'm doing well. And what part of the world are you in? New Jersey. New Jersey. Nice. And are you from that area or are you from? Yes, uh, born and raised. Okay. Awesome. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey toward becoming an assistant? So did you know you wanted to be an assistant? Did you fall into the role? How did that all begin? I feel like it's a combination of both. I attended Grace Institute, which is a nonprofit business college for women of any age, any point in their life. Um, I attended right out of high school and I had an idea of wanting to work in either a corporate setting or for an attorney but wasn't sure of the right direction, wasn't sure if a four-year college was something that I wanted to pursue. And at that time, Grace Institute offered the um, opportunity to women to attend um, this college, and you can do it on a yearly basis. And I graduated with an associate's in business administration and At the end of it, before graduation, they would take you on site to law firms in the city or other places of work and just have you interview and get a feel for a day in the life of real world, of being an assistant in many different um, areas. And I started working for a law firm um, and it was very rigid, very corporate. And I kind of got a sense for, okay, maybe I don't want it to be so rigid. Maybe I want to step away from the city for a little um, work in New Jersey, be closer to home, uh, you know, look into start raising the family and things kind of just transpired where I was able to always keep my skill set up by working for many different companies, whether it was pharmaceutical advertising, cybersecurity, uh, biotechnology, and it just evolved over time where 
I developed a knack for just being very thorough and very on top and keeping that executive up to date of what was happening minute, day, week. Um, and I just enjoyed it more and more. And each position that I've had, I always, um, you know, try to emphasize it with learning more about the executive, learning more about the company itself and not it just being a nine to five, you know, answer the phone, answer the emails, being more involved, really being the strategic business partner to the executive, which is where the role has evolved to uh, more and more throughout the years. And I think it's very um, rewarding and humbling in a sense to see how the position has evolved and how uh, an assistant can be appreciated at any level, whether they're entry or they're seasoned. Um, and, you know, I think I really just, I'm very appreciative to the opportunity that Grace Institute has provided me. They were definitely the uh, stepping stone. Nice. So once you got in to the assistant career, how you, you mentioned like over time, it seems that the role has garnered more respect uh, in general, but how did you see a, that in your different roles? So like, it looks like I'm looking at your, uh, your LinkedIn and your, in your history, you've got a lot of different interesting experience and it looks like even different industries with different, you know, chief marketing officers, CEOs, uh, VP, general counsel, uh, CFOs. So as you kind of got into all of the different areas and different executives, did you find that you were drawn more to different departments or different industries? I feel that as each opportunity presented itself, I was more drawn to learning more about that industry and learning um, about the executive or the executive team. Um, each industry is completely different that I've had the chance to um, work in. So learning the ins and outs, you know, um, cybersecurity, um, biotechnology, marketing, what it takes to put all the back work into the pitch and the events and um, the, the social media aspect of it, right, which has evolved significantly over time, has um, always been intriguing. And I think that that's where, you know, working at VaynerMedia now specifically is interesting in, in its own right, because I'm having the opportunity to be mentored by the executives there while working alongside um, Gary and really just getting to understand what it takes to build social media. Hmm. Yeah, because, you know, back in uh, your early career, there was probably no social media in your job description, right? <laughs> Right. No, <laughs> no, there wasn't. Um, it was more um, geared towards corporate. Um, like I said, you know, I, I worked for um, a couple of attorneys and even just, you know, working at a pharmaceutical advertising company in the very beginning, it was more um, corporate. The social media aspect was not so much um I think introduced to the assistant, it was more left to, you know, an executive vice president or um, a marketing vice president or manager. And um, I think that what I have learned and what is what I've liked to see over the years is that 
the assistant is getting more involved and you're sitting more in on meetings and not just to, you know, sit there and take notes, but to learn and grow with the company. And I think that that's what is really important to me. I don't just want to um, be the assistant that is answering your emails and just booking your travel. I want to be involved and I, you know, would want to be able to think like my executive, think for my executive, learn about the company, really understand what we're doing on a daily basis. Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, excited to talk with you um, for a variety of reasons, but one of which is, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, for those of you listening who don't know, um, has a pretty big, uh, pretty big social media presence, pretty big YouTube presence. Um, very involved in, you know, investing and media and all that fun stuff. And so I guess my point is, I can't, I can't even imagine the number of inbound requests that he gets, you know, Instagram DMs, LinkedIn, emails, all those different things. And, you know, Valerie, I'm sure you're the (laughs) gatekeeper or the gateway or whatever you want to call it for many of those. So how do you handle and manage the mass quantity of requests? I think that it works well because we have a team that assists Gary. So there's uh, four of us working directly with him to receive and respond um, on his behalf with all of these inbound requests. And the good thing is the communication that we have between each other as a team and with Gary to make him aware of what's coming in, discuss with him the importance and basically sometimes just presenting the decision of we think X is going to take precedence over Y. Let us know your thoughts. And then from there, we make it happen. And there's really not much pushback because the wheels are turning in a way that we're all on the same wavelength. And it just works in a sense of we understand the priorities for him. And so we come together as a team before we go over his schedule or we go over the requests that came in in an email or through social media and just gather as much information as possible for him. I think that, I I mean, I think I know that is the most important key way of success with your executive is to gather as much information as possible. And I'm sure you do the same um, with your CEO that, you don't want to just bring, you know, a very um, vague inbound email. Mm-hmm. You want to do the research, you know, you want to present them with the information to say, is it a cold call? Is it really a matter of a, a business key factor? Is it going to bring the company money? You know, what's the importance of it? How can we make it work with everything else that has been coming in that is just of important? You know, Mm -hmm. Um, so we work together as a team to field this information to him. And that's really what makes the, the, the wheels run every day. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. So how do you say no to requests in a kind way? Do you have templates that you could share? I know a lot of assistants are, you know, dealing with a lot of requests and they have a hard time saying no in the first place, but even just having different language to use when declining requests. Yeah, I think you have to keep it very polite, concise, and professional in the sense that every request is on a different like basis in the sense that you can't always respond the same to everyone. Maybe someone else needs a little bit more handling, white glove, response. So I've always tried to just handle it on an as needed basis in the sense that if I'm responding and it's not something that he wants just to very 
tactfully but sternly, politely, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, you know, decline, but still almost in the sense that you are saying we'll reach back out to you later. This could be an opportunity later down the line. Um, We'll revisit this in the coming months is something that you're not completely shutting them down uh, unless, you know, the individual or the company seems to be coming off, you know, in, in an indirect manner that just makes you have to shut it down with mm-hmm. say le- your legal department. Um, you know, you never want to get to, to that direction, but you want to just politely decline. You could maybe use as per, your executive or, you know, at this time we will not be pursuing, you know, this connection or at this time we will not be pursuing this call. We will, you know, reach out to you in the coming months, you know, when you could say your executive is ready to readdress the uh, question or the -hmm. situation. I think, you know, you just have to tactfully take it on an as needed basis. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So I was trying to look it up and, you know, it's kind of hard to find it. I know uh, Gary posts a lot of content in a lot of different channels. And so Mm -hmm. I I couldn't find the exact quote, but I remember there was a, maybe it's an Instagram post or, you know, a LinkedIn post or something back a while back. And basically it was something along the lines, Gary had, had said something about how valuable an assistant is an executive assistant is or a personal Mm -hmm. assistant. And again, I can't remember the exact quote, but I remember being like, yeah, that's right. Preach Gary preach. Cause a lot of executives obviously follow him. And I was excited to see his support for the executive assistant role. So I wanted to ask you, you know, you've, you've worked with a lot of executives over the years. What's it like working for an executive who understands the value you bring versus the executives that are just kind of like, Oh, you're just doing what I tell you. Right. It's for me, because I've been there a little over a year now. um, It is the first company and the first executive that makes you genuinely feel like you are valued. Um, So he is very true to his word (laughs) in what you heard him say. It's, Along the lines of black and white, you know that there does not need to be any, um, like your hand held, but you understand over time his way of thinking and the company's way of thinking. And it flows very nicely in the sense that everybody is humbled and happy to work together. And the vision is all, and everyone understands the vision and everyone genuinely cares about each other. Um, I have to also say that the chief heart officer, Claude, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to speak with her, but she is in fact amazing and also one of his right hands in the sense that she has the pulse of the company and you just feel a sense of belonging and and understanding um, and not just it's, you know, just do this for me and this is why I said it. You know, he will take the time to explain to you what he needs, what his thought process is, how it can all work together, and will encourage you to meet with other executives in the company if you want to learn about a certain product or client that the agency has just brought on. We have a mentorship program. He's very much about that. So I would have to say for the first time in my life, and that's what made me apply over a year ago, even though we were in in pandemic mode still and all home all the time, was how he does speak and that it's his vision is true to how he is every day. It's not sugarcoated. So what everyone else sees in a podcast or at an event that he's speaking at is how he is in the office. And I think that's very comforting. That would make anyone, I think, want to work at Vayner. (laughs) Right. Yeah, that's great. What's your number one tip for working remotely? I like both. Tell you the truth. I, I feel 
uh, very lucky to have been able to work remote as long as I have um, in the sense that when you have a family, I think it makes it a lot easier. Um, my number one tip would be to don't lose sight of your routine that you did when you went into the office every day in the sense that you should get up, you should get yourself ready um, and just try to feel good about yourself still. Mm. You know, um, not every day is, are you going to feel a hundred percent, but you know, you don't also want to just hang out in, um, not have yourself put together and ready for the day. So I try to always stay true to, I'm going to get up, I'm going to get myself ready and that, you know, we're going to have a good day <laughs> right, right? and, um, just keep interacting with the team and, and be focused and whether we're, we're remote or we go in, let's go about it the same way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's such an important, you know, there's a, there's like a physical element too, where, you know, you sit at a certain desk to do your work versus a different desk to maybe eat your lunch. And it, and it really changes your mindset and gets you in the zone. If you have those different segmented physical spaces, even. Right. And I think too, when you're working remote, you have to, I, I mean, and I'm, you know, at fault for this, you could sit at your desk and not move because you're not commuting. You're, you know, you're, you're not rushing to the bus or to your car, or to the train. You're waking up and getting your cup of coffee and you're sitting down at your desk and you start working. And I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm a culprit to that by default sometimes where that happens. Um, but just remind yourself, get up, take that break, go have your lunch, maybe go for a walk. Um, because when you're in the office, you have more of that interaction of, you know, you've went to go get your cup of coffee and you stop to talk to a coworker and then you were able to walk back to your desk. And it's different when you're remote because you don't have that interaction. So I think that, you know, taking, if you have to set an alarm, even, I don't know if some, this is something that you've recognized too, Jeremy and, you know, going for that walk to take that break, um, I think is yeah. important. Yeah, I agree. I, I try to take, you know, a walk at lunch or even just walk around in circles in my basement if the weather's nasty. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Just to get some motion and yeah. try to feel like a normal routine in a sense, because <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like the new normal is hybrid. And I think that it's important also for employers to recognize that and not penalize their employees for that because everybody's priorities have changed through COVID and, you know, it's not something that's going away. So I think for executives and companies just to be more cognizant and aware of you know, if my employee is able to perform remotely and they're not comfortable coming in five days a week, then work something out where in a sense, maybe they're in two and home three, you know, or mm -hmm. every other or something. I just think that the flexibility of that is something long-term for uh, executives and companies to recognize. That's, that's my hope. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Well, uh, Valerie, thanks for sharing your story. When you uh, reached out to me about the podcast, you also mentioned that you had a few questions for me. So I was going to hand the mic over to you and let you interview me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be great. Um, what made you choose, you know, the EA life? You like have you, how you asked me, was it something that you always knew or did you fall into it or what has been in your experience so far? Yeah, that's a great question. So what I, when I was early on in my career, I essentially kind of fell into it in the sense of I was doing, I was working at a nonprofit um, church organization and I was doing music and I was really all excited about doing music and want to do music for my whole life. And then the organization outgrew my musical talent and abilities, um, the short way to say it. And so I started to figure out, okay, well, if I'm 
not quite able to keep up with my music skills, are there other skills that I can, that I am keeping up with? And I, over time, I noticed that the organizational uh, project management, um, you know, punctuality, all the, all the detail oriented, all that stuff I was really good at. And the people around me were not very good at it at all. And so I was like, okay, either these people are really, really poor at organization and details, or I'm really good at it, or maybe a mixture of both. Mm -hmm. And so basically I, I, I saw that my skills in that area were actually outgrowing the organization. And so that helped me see, okay, wait, this, maybe this is actually my, my strength and my, um, you know, whatever you want to career path, calling, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I leaned more into, all right, let's, let's do the things I'm really good at. And I'm, and I'm the best at in my circle. And as I did that, it just, it just kept growing and growing and growing. And I just, I never felt like the organization was too complex or the executive assistant to the founder role was, it was definitely challenging and, and, and difficult and seasons of really hard, hard times, but Mm -hmm. I never felt like, Oh, I can't do this. Like I, I can't, I can't grow and keep up or, or stay ahead of the pace. So that's kind of how I leaned into it. And then I read an article in the Harvard business review from Melba Duncan about the value of uh, executive assistance. And it was breaking down even like the, the monetary value as she was arguing to executives, basically saying, Hey, this is how much money an executive assistant is worth and can save you. And that's when I was like, okay, this is actually a career. So that's the, that's the short version of how I chose the EA life or how it chose me. Yeah, that's, that's very um, intriguing and comforting in the same breath, because I had the pleasure of meeting Melba a couple of years ago, and she is someone that I look up to because I felt the same way when you're saying on the article that she wrote, Mm -hmm. she is definitely someone who will fight for an executive assistant's worth. And I think she has definitely paved the way for us in a sense that it also doesn't have to be geared towards just women, which I think is amazing. Right. Um, you can start it basically at any part, point in your life, you know, and the, and the drive and the um, willingness to learn and, and be open to the possibilities are endless. And, you know, I think that for, for people like you and Melba to bring that to the attention of, you know, two other executives in the world is um, where it needs to be. And we need to have more podcasts and more posts. And um, I don't know whether it's like, you know, we go in there with a, a sign up, hire this EA because this is what she would, she's worth and she will, you know, bring your life so much more ease Mm-hmm. Um, whatever it takes, really. <laughs> yeah, I agree. What decide, um, what made you decide that you wanted to be a mentor and a coach as well? Well, I, you know, when I was in between ro- uh, roles, my prior executive had gotten fired and it kind of like was a shock to my career and my life because I was like, Oh, I think, I think I'm going to be here forever and support this executive forever. And things changed uh, literally overnight. And so I decided to take a break, hit reset, kind of look at how my life was going. And I realized I was burned out and not in a, in a healthy position. And so I took that time off and I decided I don't want to burn out and I don't want my executive to burn out again. But then I, you know, I'm, I'm a helper. I like helping other people uh, as part of why I'm a good assistant. And I just thought, okay, it's not just about me avoiding burnout. 
or my helping my executive resist burnout. It's, it's gotta be more than that. Like I want to help as many assistants in the world and as many executives in the world as I can avoid burnout and resist burnout. And so that's what kind of got me to thinking, okay, I'm going to learn my lesson. I'm going to document what I learned, all the mistakes I made what my executive made and just try to help as many assistants and executives as possible. And so that's kind of the jump start. And I just started blogging, started LinkedIn networking, started reaching out and to other assistant trainers or coaches or speakers or whatnot, and really just tried to put myself out there and just, again, share the mistakes that I made and the lessons that I learned in hopes that they would help other assistants. And then over time, I got feedback on, Hey, this is really helpful. You know, this, this is, you know, say that again, you know, share the people sharing my, my thoughts. And so that's when I decided, you know, okay, I, I guess I, I guess what I'm doing is helping others. And so I should try to do that more. And so that's kind of how I fell into coaching and speaking and training and all that. And then why I decided to write a book was because I was having the same conversations over and over again with different mm-hmm. assistants. And I thought, okay, this isn't really going to scale. Like this isn't m- me t- having one-on-one conversations with assistants isn't going to help as many assistants as possible. And so that's why I decided to put all my ideas and thoughts and lessons in my book. And that way I could actually reach more assistants and more executives um, without, you know, being on one-on-one calls all day, every day. (laughs) Right. Do you feel that executives do lean into the book or the podcast or has it only been assistance? Uh, Definitely they do. I would say obviously the majority are assistants, um, Mm -hmm. but I've heard from dozens of executives that say, Hey, I, you know, heard your podcast or I read this article or I, got your book for my assistant and we're going through it together. So yeah, I definitely see the, the value or on the, on the flip side, the assistants are taking what they learn to their executives. Like one of my favorite stories is a a couple of assistants actually ping me about this, but they got the book and in the calendar chapter, I talk about this ideal week template and this tactic Mm -hmm. that I use where you, set up blocks in an ideal week for your executive. And they said, Oh, you know, I, I I went over the ideal week in the book. I thought it was awesome. So I took it to my executive. We walked through it, we set it up and they were just so excited. And they're like, this is, this is game changing. This ideal week thing is game changing. And I was like, well, that's on the, on the cover of the book. (laughs) It's the whole (laughs) point. You're going to be a game changing assistant. So yeah, it's, 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 it's been awesome to see how it has benefited executives, but yes, mostly, mostly assistants. That's, that's really comforting because for a second, I thought it was just assistants. So it's um, really nice to hear that you also have the executives uh, leaning in as well and working with their EA and um, really yeah. taking, you know, the knowledge that they're bringing them and the suggestions um, and running with it because I mean, as an assistant, you are there to make their life easier. So I think that if they truly respect their assistant, um, they'll take the time, you know, to listen and work together, which is really great. Yeah. And, you know, I actually am writing a workbook. I'm just, just finishing it now. And the workbook has a section for each chapter that's literally called lead your executive. And so it's, it's a prompt or a question, it's like questions to ask your executive or a prompt on how to work with your executive to apply what you learned in that chapter. Mm -hmm. And so I'm all about like, don't just, you know, passively consume this content, but do something with it. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's, that's the key. (laughs) That is definitely the key. You can't just talk about it. You have to be able to apply it every day. Yeah. Awesome, Valerie. Well, thanks for interviewing me. That was fun. Uh, (laughs) And thanks for letting me interview you. Uh, Best of luck to you in your career. Where where can people reach out if they want to say hi and connect? Yes, 
thank you for the time as well. And I can be reached uh, via LinkedIn under Valerie Gagliano. Um, I'm happy to discuss our interview and how we were able to connect and any questions about uh, the day in the life uh, that I lead every day um, as an assistant and my experience over the years. So thank you very much, Jeremy. Awesome. Well, I'll put the link in the show notes, leaderassistant.com slash 169. And thanks again. And we'll talk soon. Thank you. Have a great day. Please review on Apple Podcasts. Go Bullos.com.